Bien, bonjour. C'est un grand honneur pour nous d'accueillir ici au Collège de France le professeur Timothy Brooke, qui est professeur à l'Université de Colombie-Britannique au Canada, qui est un spécialiste mondialement reconnu de l'histoire des Chines, de la Chine des Ming. Il a notamment dirigé l'History of Imperial China de Cambridge en six volumes de 2007 à 2009. Il est l'auteur de très nombreux ouvrages qui lui ont valu des reconnaissances International, parmi les plus prestigieuses, le public français euh, l'a découvert euh, à l'issue euh, de la traduction de différents euh, livres. Le plus euh, célèbre, euh, c'est Le chapeau de Vermeer, le XVIIe siècle à l'aube de la mondialisation, euh, poursuivi par La carte perdue euh, de John Selden, euh, paru euh, également euh, chez Payot en 2015. C'est ce qui lui a valu d'ailleurs une autre, euh, une autre euh, invitation à laquelle... Euh, j'ai été heureux de m'associer puisque euh, Tim Brook va parler dans quelques jours au festival Nous Autres, euh, qui est un festival d'histoire et, euh, et de théâtre à Nantes, précisément sur ce rapport entre euh, l'objet euh, et euh, le monde. Mais c'est d'une certaine manière dans le sillage d'un autre livre également paru euh, chez Payot sous le titre « Sous l'œil des dragons, la Chine des dynasties Yuan et Ming » que le professeur Brooke a choisi de placer son intervention d'aujourd'hui et celle qui aura lieu le vendredi 16 juin, c'est-à-dire autour d'une réflexion sur « The Great State des, » des Ming, un rapport, au fond, une relecture de l'histoire impériale à partir de la consistance euh, de, euh, les, des empires euh, asiatiques, euh, chinois et mongols. C'est une euh, recherche euh, en cours, m'a-t-il expliqué. C'est important euh, pour nous, évidemment, dans un régime euh, d'histoire euh, comparée où, euh, au fond, l'épreuve de la Chine a toujours été, pour l'historiographie française, qu'elle s'intéresse à l'histoire de euh, l'État ou à celle des empires, euh, une manière, effectivement... Euh, de confronter euh, ces, euh, euh, voilà, ces, ces hypothèses euh, et, et sur cette question euh, de euh, la construction et la consistance euh, des euh, États. Euh, le professeur Brooke va parler euh, en anglais. Euh, je lui laisse euh, volontiers euh, la parole. Et ensuite, si vous avez des, des questions, eh bien, nous pourrons euh, lui euh, discuter avec lui. Bah, Peut-être que vous pouvez... Euh, ah, je non. pense que je... je ah, oui, de vous venez ici, oui, d'accord. Oui. Um, ex euh, euh, je vous prie de me permettre de parler en anglais. Je, je pense que c'est mieux pour tout, pour moi et pour vous aussi. So I will, I will speak in English today. Let me thank uh, Patrick Boucheron for this invitation to, to speak again at, uh, at the college. Um, I want to talk today about the concept of empire. Um, and I'm, I'm going to do a couple of... Um, propose a couple of dissociations that we need to undertake. We, we divide empires, ancient and modern, and we also divide them Western and Asian, and I want to rethink some of those divisions. I want to do this, I'm going to start by doing this from the European vocabulary for empire, and then I'm going to move to the Asian vocabulary for empire. I think this is important because we live today in a world that is haunted by empires a world that has been created by empires and a world that continues to be shaped by empires. And I think if we don't understand this, if we somehow think that, that the world is unfolding behind a kind of calm Westphalian nation state model, we will miss the way in which the world has changed over time and the way it's, in which it's going to change in the future. So, empires, do, do Asians form empires? Marco Polo didn't notice that Kublai Khan ruled an empire, or rather, he didn't use that language. If we go to his, um, his uh, Divisement du Monde, uh, he speaks of Kublai, the, the leader of the Mongol Empire, as le grand Khan, uh, le grand seigneur des seigneurs, mais, but he does not use the term em emperor to designate this man. What he is doing is simply translating the uh, Mongol term Kagan into, uh, into whatever languages he spoke, Italian, Franco-Italian. Um, so the word, uh, no one thinks that there is an empire 
at the other side of the world in the 13th century. The next time Europeans go to China is at the end of the 16th century. And still they don't see an empire there. Uh, if we look at the ways in which, say, Matteo Ricci, the Italian missionary, talked about China, he uses terms like um, kingdom, or, uh, or um, in Spanish, reino, uh, rey. He's, he's using terms that don't necessarily invoke the idea of emperor. He do, empire. He does analogize the, the emperor of China, and here I even, to you even use the word emperor, now I'm, I feel I'm on troubled ground. He doesn't use, he doesn't translate Huangdi as, or he, he analogizes the emperor of China to the Roman emperor, but it's a very loose analogy. And for him, there is really no such thing as a Chinese empire. We see that word emerge in European languages in the 1650s. Um, so for example, when the Jesuit procurator Alvaro Semedo wrote his account of China in Portuguese in 1638, he gave it the title Relation da Propagandation da Fé no Reino da, da China. So it's a reino that he perceives to be there. That's 1638. In 1642, Manuel de Faria y Souza uh, revises this book for publication in Spanish. He translates the title Imperio de la China on the front page. So between 1638 and 1642, the, 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 the idea that China might be something we could call an empire begins to come into view, but it doesn't actually percolate into the text. The text never uses the word empire. It appears only on the front page. Um, <clears throat> there is a 1655 English translation of this book, and the translator uses the word kingdom. He doesn't use empire. The same ambivalence about whether China is an empire or not can be found that the, the very same year in Dutch, 1655, a single author, the missionary Martino Martini, has two books published in Dutch. In one book, China is an empire, and in the other book, China is not an empire. <clears throat> so there is, um, there is it, it's, for me, it's interesting to watch this subtle movement between China not as an empire and China as an empire. And it's important to me as a China historian because one speaks always of the Chinese empire, but I'm puzzled to know, I've been puzzling myself to know why it is we speak of China as an empire. So it emerges sometimes in, sometime between 1642, 1655, and it's really by 1660s that Europeans speak to each other of the Chinese empire. It wasn't there before. So I make this point, I, I, there's no great point I want to make here, except that we should be aware that our language, our units of analysis have been created in uh, the European context and not in the Chinese context. Um, and that context, perhaps the idea of China being an empire, is most effectively tied to the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, in which the states of Central Europe convened a peace conference to sort out the problems of the Holy Roman Empire. So there is some, some sense in which empire is becoming a problematic category just at the time that that term is applied to China. So every historical use of a term brings with it the connotations it carried at the time, and of course the same is true today. There is no state, to my knowledge, that likes to declare itself to be an empire. To be an empire is a bad thing. And, uh, but in fact, states, the, all the large states of the 21st century um, are inheritors of empire. And this is the problem that I'm going to get to at the end of today's lecture. I'm going to use the, the concept of downstream imperial polity. That is a state that has been created downstream from a former empire and try to understand how that is shape, shapes the world today. So we have, Empire in, in European languages is classically an ancient term and a modern term. The ancient term, of course, is associated with Rome. The modern term is probably most clearly associated with the British Empire, uh, but there are many other European empires as well. And we think of these as being categorically two different things. And in a sense, historically, well, not just in a sense, historically they are. But I want to think about what is similar between ancient and modern empires so that we can begin to think about what might be similar between European and Asian empires. 
Uh, a definition that's currently in play of empire that I like comes from a book that Jane Burbank and Frederick Cooper published uh, about six years ago. Uh, this is their definition. Empires are large political units, expansionist or with a memory of power extended over space, polities that maintain distinction and hierarchy as they incorporate new people. Um, I find three core elements in this definition. An empire has to be large, an empire is hierarchically structured internally, and it has a history of expansion. I find these three elements quite useful to work up a general category across which all instances of empire can probably be at least compared, if not placed in the same category. Um, my slight concern with creating any kind of universal definition like this is that we end up lumping all historical empires together without asking how particular imperial formations appeared in the particular times and places in which they did, because history never works at the level of generality. It's always working at the level of particularity. Now, it's not just that Asian empires might be theoretically distinct from European empires, but empires everywhere before the modern period have risen and fallen in relationship to what happens locally, not what happens elsewhere in the category. Uh, modern empires are going to be a little different. Modern empires are able to draw on the imperial experience of other cultures in formulating themselves, as the British Empire does, famously uh, models itself ideologically on the Roman Empire. At any rate, um, these distinctions, these, uh, as a historian, I want to maintain these distinctions, but at the same time, there is an analytical benefit to bringing past and present empires together in the, into at least the same room, if not the same category, and also bringing European and Asian empires together into the same room to try and understand what is it about um, the experience of empire in the West and the experience of empire in the East that might help us understand each a little bit better. To do this, though, I don't want to start from the European case. Of course, I want to start from the China case. In, <clears throat> excuse me, in the course of, of decades of working on the history of China, I came to notice a term. It, it took me a long time to actually recognize it as a term uh, that appears in Chinese. And this is a term um, which is very simple in Chinese, da guo, da meaning large, guo meaning state. I think this is actually an important conceptual category in Asian history. And it's one of those cases of um, they're missing something that sits there in plain sight. And I'm curious to know why we've missed it and what happens if we retrieve this category, we recognize this dagua, this great state, as something that isn't simply just a vague description, but is actually has precise uh, content that can be analytically um, thought about. I've been drawn to notice the great state because of recent thinking I've been doing on interpolity relations in Asia over the last eight centuries. It's led me to regard the great state as a distinctive type of political formation that should be in our conceptual toolkit if we, as scholars of Asia who are working on this kind of thing, are to participate in writing a global history of empire, which I think we have to be. Given the near ubiquity of the term dagua, the virtual absence of any discourse on this concept is, turns out to be more than just a curiosity. And it's worth asking why we don't notice it and what it might signify. The term is unambiguous in every uh, Asian language that I know, plus the ones I don't. Um, in Chinese, da guo, large state. In Japanese, dai koku, same characters. In Korean, de guk, same characters. In Vietnamese, de kok, same derivation. In Khitan, it's masaga gur. In Mongolian, ik ulus. In Jurchen and Manchu, ambun guru, every, ambun guru. In every case, large state have been put together. Only in Tangut do they change the order, Lyata, because of the nature of Tangut grammar. So this phrasing is so simple that it's not obvious that anything specific or even technical is being named, but I think it is. Um, and so it's a term that's been left hidden in plain sight and I want to think about what it might help us do.
by if we recover it. Well, as a China historian, the Ware Da Guo begins to appear, and it, it, it appears almost as, as an afterthought, or at least historians have treated it as an afterthought, um, at the beginning of the Yuan Dynasty in the 13th century, when we're back with Kublai Khan uh, in, in, uh, uh, in 1271. And his en enthronement edict, of December 18th, 1271, declares that he will now, uh, uh, his state will now take the name Da Yuan, large, big, great Yuan, which is the Chinese term his Chinese advisors chose for him. Um, Kublai probably knew a smattering of Chinese, but his Chinese wasn't very good. So his advisors gave him the concept of Yuan, but the Da is sitting in front of it. He doesn't explain why his state is Da, why it is great. He, just, he does note in his enthronement edict that um, he's completed the great enterprise, the same Da, he's completed the great enterprise of his grandfather. His grandfather is Genghis Khan. Um, Genghis Khan's goal was to extend his rule to all four directions, that is to rule universally. And Kublai said that he has now achieved what Genghis Khan set out to do. Not true, but that's fine. This is just political talk. But he says in his edict that he needed a great name, a Da Hao, in order to express the Da Ya, the great enterprise of his grandfather. And so he comes up with the Da Yuan, the great Yuan. Um, but he doesn't explain the name particularly. It's just to him natural that the Yuan would be Da. It suggests at one level that the use of great, this identification of a polity as a great polity, has already become somewhat formulaic. He doesn't need to comment on it. Um, but it's a little puzzling, because if you look back in earlier Chinese dynasties, the Da comes up occasionally. You see a Da Song, a Da Tang, a Da Han. But these, these terms are not used uh, uh, um, consistently. And um, don't, they, they, they're certain, used in certain formal contexts but they're not used by the state itself. The state does not seem to insist that it is a dagua, that it is a great state. It's a way of speaking that sort of acknowledges scale, perhaps, but that's all. So where did Kublai get the idea of being a great state? Well, I think you have to look at the non-Han dynasties in order to, to see this. Um, his immediate predecessor was the Jin Dynasty, uh, a, a, a political formation of the Jurchens, who were the forerunner of the Manchus. Their dynasty was called the Jin. But in fact, if you start to go back and look at the records, the Jin is never the Jin. It's always the Da Jin. It's always the Great Jin. Um, this is attested as early as uh, um, 1115. Uh, the, the Jurchens also used Da Jin, which means the great Jurchen state. Um, this is a term that appears uh, somewhat later. But the, the Jurchens didn't call their state great uh, on their own doing. If we, if we look further upstream, we come to the Ketanguts. Uh, they had a dynasty called the Xia, um, and always speak of it as the Da Xia. For some reason, Chinese historiography calls this dynasty the Xi Xia, the Western Xia, but the the Tanguts themselves never used the term. Um, they were the Daxia, or sometimes the Baigao Daxia Guo, the great Xia state of white and high. It has to do with certain mythological references in the title. Sometimes they just called themselves the Da Guo, the great state. But the Tanguts didn't make this up either, because if we go keep going back, we come to the Kitans, who had a dynasty known as the Liao. And again, they consistently refer to themselves as the Da Liao, uh, the great Kitan state. Or sometimes the, the Da Qidan Guo, the great state of the Kitans. Now, we could foreclose this discussion by saying, all right, they, they, they saw that sometimes the Song was the Da Song, sometimes the Tang was the Da Tang, so they're just imitating Chinese practice. Um, but I think to, to um, fold the, 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 the um, states of, the, of northern China and the steppe into the history of China is a huge mistake. We lose track of what um, steppe political traditions have done to influence the way in which China has emerged as a, as a modern state. 
Um, so so when, the, when the ketones in the 930s form the great ketone state, it's not because they're engaging in some tryst with China's destiny. It's because they needed a name for the thing that they had created. They, it was understood by the Kitan warrior society that as they expanded, they were expanding out into territories that were not Kitan and that had never been under Kitan authority. And they needed a name for this entity that they had created. It was no, this was no longer the Kitan state. It was something bigger. It extended outside. And I think that is the impulse. The impulse for thinking of the state as a dog law is coming from um, the northern steppe tradition. It's not coming from any political traditions within China. Let's go back to Kublai Khan. He would have known of all of this. He understood, he placed himself very much in the lineage of these, of these earlier steppe uh, traditions. But I think his overwhelming um, model, if you like, was uh, what his grandfather did, Genghis Khan. In 1206, there is a great assembly at which the Mongol, le uh, well, the Mongol leaders that uh, Genghis could control came together and elected him as the leader of the Mongol people. And at this great assembly, he asserts his, we, well, the documents for this event are not, are not particularly good, but from what we've got, it seems that he asserted his rulership not just over the Mongol people or the Mongol state, and in Mongol, this is the Mongol Ulus, but a greater ulus, and he, he calls it an ulus under the protection of heaven. He has this idea that there is the zone of, in which the Mongols live, but that there is a greater zone as well, and that his, um, his vision of conquest will be to move out from the Mongol zone into this lar larger zone. Um, he, he calls it the, the, the ulus, the, the state of the people of the yurts, meaning nomadic peoples, uh, as well as sedentary peoples, that is, peoples with doors. This is the Mongols distinguished between people who lived in tents and people who had doors in their houses. He was, his empire, this new thing that he was, that he believed he was creating, included both the yurts and the doors. Um, so as this state expands, and Genghis Khan uh, is very aggressive about ex expanding his political authority, um, something comes into view. There is no name recorded at the time for what this entity is. Hmm. But if you, in Mongol, the term for the, a Mongol state is, re, it remains only for the Mongols. It is not for the other people that are brought into the state. Um, there is a suggestion in a Chinese text that already the idea of a Mongol great state is beginning to emerge very quickly, within five years of Genghis Khan's becoming the ruler of the Khans. Uh, we have one reference in Chinese about a Da Mongu Guo. Um, there's nothing in Mongolian. Um, the title isn't actually attested until 1246. Uh, Guyuk Khan, who's one of Genghis's descendants, uh, sends a letter to Pope Innocent IV in 1246. There's a seal on this letter. The letter still exists. And in this letter, he calls himself the Ik Mongol Ulus und Dalaiin Khan, the universal Khan of the great Mongol state. So the great Mongol state has emerged as something distinct from the Mongol state by 1246 and was probably there earlier. So if we can accept this idea that there's a step for the Mongols from going from an Ulus to an Ik Ulus, from a state to a great state, then um, I think we've got to start changing the translations I've been using. So instead of talking about the great Yan, we actually have to recognize this Ik and the Ulus, the two component characters of great state, as constituting a, a, a new category, a different category that separated any kind of ethnic homeland from the larger polity that is being uh, created. I'm, I'm very much influenced in all of this by uh, a friend and scholar, a Mongol, uh, Lamsaran Mugerde, uh, who's, who's sorted out this early Mongol history. I'm, I don't myself read Mongolian. But I'm persuaded uh, by his argument that, uh, that uh, what Genghis is creating here is not uh, a state in which Mongols are great, and in English if you said great Mongol state it sounds like great is 
modifying Mongol, but it's actually the Mongol great state. So you have to move the great in after the ethno ethnonym and discover the great state that is being identified. So, um, so why is this important? Um, it's important because um, I think a, a, a new term has come into play. And perhaps it's there sometimes in the use of da, of great, back, further back in the Chinese tradition. But it's the Mongols who really conceptualize this creation of a polity over which they have no claim historically, but it's a claim given to them by the mandate of heaven. Now, the mandate of heaven is usually thought very much as a Chinese um, political trope, which explains why an emperor has the authority to rule. Um, but um, arguably, this concept of heaven as the giver of sovereignty is something that comes from the Inner Asian tradition, uh, possibly from the Xiongnu, uh, the Huns, uh, and that is something that, that Chinese uh, are picking up and absorbing into their, if, if you like, the theology of rule in China. Now, as the Mongol state, uh, after Genghis uh, creates his state and his sons go on to further expand it, by the time you get to the grandsons, the state begins to fall apart into different components. And curiously enough, the uh, Ik Mongol Ulus, the, the Mongol great state, as we should now call it, continues to be recognized as something that exists, even though in effect it's starting to fall apart. And it's at the point of the, the Ik Mongol Ulus not falling apart, but moving off into, into four separate zones, it's at that point that Kublai declares that he's founding the Yuan great state. And uh, again, I, I want to change the order here, not talk about a great Yuan dynasty, but I talked about the Yuan great state, because Kublai is, Kublai is claiming direct descent from Genghis Khan, and therefore his polity is in direct descent from the Ik Mongol Ulus, the Mongol great state, and he, as the great Khan, is the ruler not just of this thing called the Yuan Great State, but in fact of all of the Mongol Great State. And as that Mongol Great State begins to disappear, then the Yuan Great State sort of steps in and becomes the polity that he rules. So that um, this doesn't... Uh, the, the Mongol background perhaps doesn't exhaust uh, uh, where this concept of great state is coming from, but it's what I think gives it the dynamic to make it uh, an essential part of political vocabulary for Asian states. The Vietnamese pick this up very quickly. Uh, Vietnam calls itself Dai Viet from, I'm, I don't have it on the top of my head, perhaps as early as the 11th century. So this idea of a great state has already percolated down into, percolated down into Vietnam. And in fact, the, the term Dai Viet will be continued to be used into the 19th century, I think, uh, when, it's, when it's, uh, it's finally abandoned. So Vietnam is, is one of the earliest states to proclaim itself a great state outside the Inner Asian tradition. But it's the Inner Asian tradition that I think is most interesting. Several decades ago, um, Joseph Fletcher, um, was arguing, was trying to develop a way of modeling the relationship between inner Asian polities and Chinese states. Uh, and at, at that point, when he's doing this, which is in the, the, the 1970s, um, he's arguing for a need to distinguish between the kind of super bureaucracies and the uh, or the large bureaucracies of Asia, East and West Asia, from the super polities of nomadic Asia. He's, so he's trying to, to get us to see that there are separate categories here, that, that somehow the Mongols aren't somehow some residual category that you sweep in either East if you're looking at China or West if you're looking at Persia. You need to distinguish the, the, what he calls the grand conships, uh, super tribal formations over multi-tribal nomadic peoples from agrarian bureaucratic uh, empires. He stresses that a great Khan emerges out of very different conditions um, and that a great Khan might exploit bureaucratic conditions in zones in which there is a bureaucratic state, um, but, uh, but this is often only useful in a, in a kind of transitional sense. 
and, and it's a transition that can be protracted, and the outcome often results in the weakening of the nomadic traditions of the state that is, uh, that, that eventually bureaucratizes, whether it's in, a, um, in an Ottoman style or a Chinese style. But this insight enabled Fletcher to link nomadic and agrarian polities within a unified continuum of Asian state formation, while recognizing that there are distinctive lineages. So I rather fancy <coughs> placing myself kind of in the wake of what, what Joseph Fletcher has done. And, uh, but to perhaps even give the inter-Asian political traditions um, greater weight, or greater, at least a larger legacy that, than Fletcher was willing to do. So my proposal, that the, the, this great, the concept of a great state, the great state, becomes the sign under which both uh, Fletcher's great conship and the large agrarian polity can be located. The convergent history of the term, particularly as it was mobilized in inner Asia, transformed expectations a millennium, a millennium ago about what a state was and what a state leader should aspire to do. And that tradition has been extremely powerful in Asia ever since then. Um, after the Yuan Dynasty uh, collapses in 1368, the Ming comes along. The Ming declares itself to be a great state, and that's going to be the subject of my second lecture. Um, as the Ming state is, is facing peril in the 17th century, the Jurchens reemerge, um, and uh, the Jin great state comes back again in 1621. The name is then changed to the Qing Great State in 1636, and in 1644, the Qing Great State will invade China. And uh, this is a point I like to remind my students of. Um, China did not become the Qing Dynasty. China was conquered by the Qing Dynasty. Um, now, um, this, is, this is a, so, so if I'm placing myself in, in Fletcher's, uh, if, in, in, in Fletcher's shadow here, it's because I think that, um, and, and he did too, that the, 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 uh, our, our focus on China's um, internal traditions misses a large component of what is, what is to be understood, uh, particularly about the Qing Dynasty. But I would uh, take it mu much further back. This is all really just part of what has been called New Qing history, the idea that the way in which you tell the history of the Qing Dynasty has to be one that takes account of, of, of the Qing Dynasty's inner Asian past. But I would put that inner Asian past central in any attempt that we try to make to understand what the Qing Dynasty was about. Well, uh, the Qing, uh, the Yuan, Ming, and Qing were not the only great states of East Asia. As I said, Vietnam was a great state, the earliest of these of, of the non-northern great states. Um, other polities around Asia pick up this terminology. Japan is using um, uh, Dai Nihonkoku, the Japan great state, as early as the 16th century, but it doesn't really become a formal uh, part of the formal language of the Japanese state until after the Tokugawa family has taken control and consolidated its hold over the islands. It works very nicely for them because it, instead of a, a series of um, smaller states, which the Japanese arch archipelago was in the 16th century, the Tokugawa are, are unifying all of the Japan islands and therefore claiming that they now have great state status. Um, it's not a major concept for J Japanese until the beginning of the 20th century, as Japan moves, if you like, from the period of ancient empires to the period of modern imperialism. As Japan does so, Japanese nationalists at the beginning of the 20th century want to retroject this title back into their history. And so they start talking about 3,000 years of the Japan great state. It's a complete projection on the part of the 20th century nationalists, but there it is, and then becomes widely accepted as though Dai Nihonkoku, the Japan, Japanese great state, is something that has been there forever. Um, Koreans pick this up as well. They pick up great state terminology in 1897. The Choson dynasty is briefly reorganized under a new name called the Daehan Jeguk, the Great Hand Empire. And the Jeguk they use is actually 
a translation of a Japanese term which is translated from a European term for empire in the modern sense, uh, if you like. And gradually the Jeguk falls out, but De Han, Great Han, becomes the term that Korea uh, recognizes itself under. And curiously, Korea is about to fall to Japanese uh, conquest. Uh, by 1910, Korea has disappeared into the Japanese Empire. But Korea keeps hold of this term. And today, in 2017, Korea is the last Asian state to actually have Dagwa, a great state, in its name. Um, and when I mention this to Koreans, they're puzzled and surprised because they have no consciousness that being the De Han, the, the great Han, the Han great state, has this, any of this connotation. But it, and in a sense, the, the Korea has not become a, another great state in any sense of the word. But this has become the language in which you speak of political authority. And to be a state that is to be recognized, to be seen as sovereign and autonomous, you have to declare yourself to become a great state. It's working at the level of language, but I think behind the language is a political reality. All right, the, the reason why I've, I've this is, this is interesting for historical reasons, and it's thinking about the existence of the great state as a political category in Asia is helping me think about how to look at Asian history from the Mongols to the present. It's, it becomes clearer to me, at least. But the reason why I want to focus on this uh, as much as I do is that it now gives me, as a historian of Asia, a way of going back to the history of empire, but not starting from the European case. Now, is great state merely an Asian way of saying empire? And I, I don't really, I'm, I'm not sure I want to do that. Um, ultimately, yes, I think it is. I think Da Guo is the Chinese term for empire, and it needs to be recognized as such. That is, if you open a Chinese dictionary and you look for the word empire, you get Di Guo, which is the, the transliter, or not the transliteration, but the transliteration through Japanese of the word, the European word empire. <clears throat> but I think the dictionary should say dagwa if we actually want to indigenize the concepts and to see the way in which Asians have been, have been thinking about this concept. Now, there's a danger in resuscitating historical terminology and trying to use it today. We risk overloading the term with an importance it didn't have at the time. Perhaps dagwa was just a, a a, a curly cue, a little decoration on state names. But if I think this risk is worth taking, it's because I sense just the opposite is at stake, which is that if we don't have the concept of Dagua, we have no way of trying to understand the success of the post-great state polities of Asia in the 20th and 21st century. And this is where I am going with, with this, this analysis. So the analytical benefit of aligning the great state and empire is, um, is in making sense of their historical outcomes. Now, if we talk about empires and imperialism in Asia, it's a term that is utterly familiar to every Asian. Uh, the history of imperialism is the history of Western imperialism in Asia. What I'm trying to dis discover here is Asia's own history of imperialism. So Asia is not only the object of imperialism, it is also an imperialist subject engaging in the same kinds of imperial exploitations that have now been uh, condemned globally in the end of, uh, after the fall of colonialism. So the concept I wish to use to make sense of this heritage is the downstream imperial polity. That is, a nation state that has inherited the sovereignty of a zone that was once under the jurisdiction of an empire and whose scale and boundaries derive to a large extent, from that earlier imperial formation. Downstream imperial polities are ubiquitous in the 21st century world, um, though we tend not to think about it, not to be aware of it, because national histories, in almost all cases, rigorously try to block out the memory of empire in the formation of the nation state. And indeed, to, for a state to acknowledge that it has been imperial in its past is often seen as a threat to its legitimacy. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, 
colleague at the University of Michigan, Mernalini Sinha, um, has noticed this in the case of India. Uh, the paradox of an empire cross-dressing as a nation state in its post-colonial anti-imperialist avatar. So she's writing of anti-colonial movements in South Asia, and she observes that nationalist intellectuals aspired to reconstitute the very foundations of existing empires while saying they were creating a nation state that was internal to its, internally meaningful to itself and not the product of empire. And she finds this is a kind of, um, it's more than an irony. It's, it, it is a, a it, it creates a political condition of leadership that makes post-war uh, post India's history very difficult uh, to make sense of, except of, as a grab for political power on the part of political elites. That is, while, while India is able to celebrate a kind of anti-imperialist national discovery of itself, it's in fact the rediscovery of itself as the British Empire. The, the, it, this didn't matter to intellectuals at the time because the goal of Indi Indian intellectuals uh, in the early 20th century was to reach the future. It was not to go back and, and reckon with the past, but only to overthrow the past in order to get to the future. But the way of doing this was, in fact, to embrace the past, and in fact, embrace the British imperial past in order to discover India's future. Now, China and India are not unique in seeking to stage the transformation from colonized past to the nation state present. This is true of every large territorial state today. So if we think of the seven largest states in the world today, China and India, but also Russia, Canada, the United States, Brazil, and Australia. All of these seven largest states assert sovereignty over a te territory assembled through the work of imperial conquest. The largest, the Russian Federation at 17 million square kilometers, presents something of an interesting and unique hybrid case of post-imperial formation. Uh, the Russian Federation emerges through a combination of European imperial experience and inner Asian imperial experience. Um, in fact, Russia's great imperial period of imperial expansion in the 18th century coincides with the expansion of the Qing dynasty in the 18th century as well, when the Russians and the Manchus between them uh, disappeared the state of Dzungaria, which lay between them, divided it between them, in order to create what is today's Sino-Russian border. Um, so both of these empires emerge simultaneously uh, to produce the modern states of China and Russia. And although Russia lost some of its great state legacy when the Soviet Union was dissolved, it continues to occupy uh, an enormous territory, the largest territory on the planet. The People's Republic of China at nine and a half million square kilometers is similarly the heir of colonial expansion. Its modern national history highlights the country's suffering at the hands of European uh, empires in the 19th century and of the Japanese empire in the 20th. And there's no way to gainsay this. It's absolutely true, particularly their, their experience at the hands of the, uh, the, the Japanese great state. But its historical upstream is occupied by the Manchu great state of the Qing and the great states that preceded it, the Ming great state and the Yuan great state. Uh, one Ulus, to go back to the Mongol term, one state did manage to break free in 1911 when the Qing dynasty collapses. That's Outer Mongolia, which exists today as an independent state. But otherwise, the Republic in 1912 was able to keep the empire intact. Um, there were attempts by many groups within that empire to re have their, uh, their own sovereignty recognized internationally. Uh, they all failed to do so. So China emerges as a very large state in, when it becomes a republic in 1912. Um, this is, of course, seen as a victory um, by all Chinese. Um, but it's seen as a, um, a, 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 as a problem among those who do not aspire to be part of this, of this great state. And in fact, the legacy poses a very heavy problem on China today. Uh, had the People's Republic inherited the Ming Dynasty, had we gone straight from the Ming to the Republic or to the People's Republic, 
it would not face many of its current difficulties uh, with the peoples whose territories were conquered either by the Mongols or the Manchus. Mongo well, Mongols themselves today, but Uyghurs, Tibetans, um, Kazakhs, Turks, the great number of peoples who found themselves brought into the great state before 1911, uh, now find themselves in a downstream imperial polity uh, to which they have no allegiance and for which they show no support and against which many now struggle. So China's victory in emerging intact after the Republican Revolution has become a long-term liability with consequences that uh, the Chinese government today has no effective policy to deal with except through military occupation and suppression. There's nothing particularly special about any of this. Writing in the context of Bosnian history, um, Eden uh, Hajdarpazik, uh, in a book that he produced a couple of years ago about Bosnia, talks about the modern ideological pull of nation compulsion. The compulsion to find, assert, and exalt the nation as though it were primal, eternal, vast, and not the product of something created at the expense of other people. Nationalist education throughout the world, not just in Bosnia, not just in China, is geared to fostering this compulsion that somehow all states, and this is as, as much true in Canada as well, although we, we are making attempts to understand the imperialist origins of the Canadian state, but it's difficult, but all states do this. You make empire disappear behind the appearance of the nation state. But from this compulsion to understand our states today as pure nations come the official discourses of uh, secession uh, or, or the condemnation of independent political movements as secessionist, as splittist, even as terrorist. And this is how the Chinese state seeks to explain its difficulties today to itself and to the world and to its people. And uh, most Chinese are willing to accept these claims. They have uh, no sense, very little sense of, of the imperial uh, production of their own state. So true to the great state mantra, national unification is the necessary goal of the state and it must continue. There, there can be no subdivision of the state, uh, which I would see as a subdivision of an empire into something, uh, uh, something that creates more effective political communities. But that is certainly not going to happen in China. The only end games for China are the assimilation of its, uh, of its non-Han populations or their annihilation, and both projects have been underway since 1949. But as, I, as I've already said, China need not be singled out for how it has handled its upstream legacy. It is not alone in living with the burden of imperialism. Um, and, but, and this is why I have wanted to bring forward the concept of Dagua as an indigenous Asian concept which roughly matches up to our idea of empire. Downstream imperial polities, whether from uh, European empires or from the great states of Asia, all face these sorts of challenges today. And how they are responding to them varies enormously and varies uh, uh, to a great extent on the, the conditions within which these these post-imperial states exist today. At any rate, rediscovering that there is such a thing as the great state may, hel may help us to see how conquest is historically embedded in nation formation in Asia. Aligning the great state with empire enables us to reflect on the imperialist processes that have eventuated globally in the world map as it is drawn today. Um, like all maps, the contemporary map that captures the world would have made no sense two centuries ago. It would probably be unrecognizable. I would guess that two centuries from now, the map of the world will look nothing like the world that we live in today. Um, but that's the process in which we find ourselves today. We are caught in this process of living downstream from an imperialist past that we haven't fully made sense of. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, euh, cher Tim, pour euh, ce panorama si, euh, si, euh, si 
séduisant et, et, et plein évidemment de, de promesses pour, euh, pour la suite et qui est en même temps une leçon de méthode. On comprend comment on ne peut pas écrire l'histoire autrement que sous la pression du présent, des, du leg colonial, euh, de la question nationale en Inde, en Chine et ailleurs. On comprend aussi que on va toujours vers un ailleurs avec des traductions et, et, et des médiations. J'ai beaucoup aimé cette question de la, du passage par le japonais, justement, pour saisir cette forme de, de l'État. La, la discussion est ouverte, ce qui m'intéresse beaucoup dans la manière que vous avez eu de présenter les choses dans la perspective d'une histoire du pouvoir, d'une histoire comparée. Je me souviens, quand on avait tenté de faire un panorama de l'histoire du monde au XVe siècle, on voyait bien que nous frappait d'évidence cette présence des empires, mais que cette évidence était peut-être une fausse évidence, parce qu'il n'y avait rien de commun, en somme, entre ce qu'on pouvait décrire morphologiquement, comme effectivement, je pense à l'Empire ottoman au XVe siècle, comme un agencement de sociétés multiconfessionnelles, multi euh, ethnique et donc euh, qui correspondait au fond à la forme moderne euh, de euh, euh, la consistance impériale telle que Fred Cooper euh, la pense, en dehors même mmh. de la question euh, coloniale, et puis d'autres euh, grands États. Et euh, évidemment, euh, si euh, l'Empire est la forme super, superlative de la puissance, euh, d'une certaine manière, ça facilite la comparaison. C'est pour ça que Marco Polo, effectivement, ne voit que des grands États, parce qu'il il habite en Europe où, où l'Empire, c'est un État en grand. Voilà, lorsque les, 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 les théoriciens de la monarchie française disent du roi qu'il est empereur en son royaume, ils ne disent rien de la forme impériale de l'État, ils disent juste qu'il n'a personne au-dessus de lui. Donc, ça a à voir avec euh, la souveraineté. C'est une sorte de, de réhaussement, au fond, euh, de sa puissance. Alors, c'est effectivement cette question-là que je trouve euh, tout à fait stimulante, cette euh, question de la forme euh, superlative de la puissance. Autrement dit, qu'est-ce qui fait euh, que est, cet État est grand Quelle est sa grandeur Est-ce que c'est une grandeur qui, qui s'étend ou, ou qui s'élève, au fond Est-ce que... Euh, est-ce qu'il est, est qu va plus loin ou est-ce qu'il va plus haut euh, C'est-à-dire, est-ce qu'on est effectivement dans une extension ou dans une euh, euh, souveraineté euh, et une, La manière, euh, au fond, euh, banalement européenne de classer euh, les pouvoirs. On va commencer à parler d'un roi comme d'un empereur quand il gagnera en puissance. Mais cette puissance n'est pas forcément un étalement territorial. Ça peut être effectivement un, un rehaussement euh, souverain. Voilà. Je ne sais pas si ça a un sens euh, de dire ça euh, ainsi, mais je me demandais si, euh, justement, à part ce qu'avait vu euh, Marco Polo de, de Kubilai, euh, c'était effectivement une extension territoriale, mais c'était aussi une, une souveraineté. Voilà. Yes. And if, if, and I will respond in English if I may. I think the, the, the uh, distinguishing between, uh, if you like, lateral scale mm -hmm. and vertical scale is a very useful one. Um, the, there was, I think in, it's in the 13th century, there is no problem for you to extend, you as the ruler, to extend your state as far mm -hmm. as you possibly can. There is, no, there is, uh, the, there is not the same uh, obsession with yes. fixed sovereignties. Yes. Um, so that in itself is not remarkable. What is remarkable is is, is uh, scaling up to heaven, so that you as the ruler are directly under heaven. The same theology seems to, I, I shouldn't say the same theology, but a very similar theology, yes. in which heaven is appointing the person who has the uh, moral authority to rule not only his own territory, but any other territory he can achieve as well. So, so you're right, uh, this is why Marco, there's nothing surprising to Marco Polo mm -hmm. about Kublai Khan, he is simply, Uh, well, he describes him in, in, uh, in, in the book as the greatest ruler who has ever lived. Mar Kublai Khan is the highest form of rulership, and he, he makes as much sense to Europeans as he does to Asians. Yes, yeah. yes. 